Welcome to the series Falling and Rising, Public Monuments and Cultur Cultural Heritage in a Time of Protest from the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History at the University of Texas at Dallas. We're very fortunate to have as our guest today, Dr. Renee Ater, who's a public scholar working at the intersection of art and history. She's the founder of Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past, a project which has been supported by fellowships from the Smithsonian, the Getty Research Institute, and the NEH Mellon Foundation. For the current academic year, she's the Provost Visiting Associate Professor in Africana Studies at Brown University, and she's also Associate Professor Emerita of American Art in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at the University of Maryland College Park. Her research and writing concern race, monument building, and national identity. She's the author of numerous articles, as well as two monographs, Keith Morrison and Remaking Race and Identity, the Sculpture of Meta Warwick Fuller. And she's written numerous essays on a wide range of public monuments. Thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Well, I wondered if you could uh, tell us about the origins of this project, um, Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past, um, sort of where it came from and how it's developed. Sure. So it started actually with a request to write a very short um, piece for uh, in American art. So to it was, it was going to be a special issue dedicated to sculpture, and they wanted me to write on um, needlework Fuller. And I said, could I write something else? <laughs> and in my research on Fuller, what I had realized, um, and I had been starting to collect files, that there were a series of monuments to Harriet Tubman. And that started to get me kind of interested. Were there more monuments to freedom fighters? Were there monuments to slavery itself, to emancipation freedom? So I wrote a very short article about, I think, 2,000 words in 2010, spring of 2010, and that kind of launched the project. Um, but I had been thinking about public monuments and space in relationship to Fuller because of a one of her uh, plaster works was cast in bronze around 1999 and installed in a park in South Boston. And so I wrote about her in a dissertation and then I wrote a book on her, but I was really interested in the fact that, that not only did they do a contemporary cast of her plaster, but then they commissioned a contemporary artist to do another monument to Harriet Tubman within that square. Mm -hmm. And I became you know, increasingly interested in the intersection of public space and monuments and race um, mm -hmm. as time kind of went on. And um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that piece, and I, I was wondering, um, you know, also given given kind of the range uh, range of monuments that you've studied, quite a wide range, um, you you have sort of a sense of the the way that uh, the views of artists and the public have evolved over the decades. And I, I was thinking, for example, of one piece that you mentioned, the the 1999 sculpture for Mary Turner, which was done by Fuller, um, and you, you wrote about that in the context of the uh, contemporary National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And um, I know it's a, it's a very, very broad kind of topic, but um, I wonder if you could describe a little bit about um, how, how kind of the, the different schools of thought have evolved just in the last few decades. Um, it, Do you mean in relationship to monument building? Right, like right. Building? So there is a connection uh, between this, these monument buildings, but I think there's been a major shift in how we understand what monuments do in public space. So I think at the time, um, let's say in let's say the 19th century, when people are thinking about uh, monument building, it's often to heroes, and particularly there's a real surge of monument building that happens after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So that interest in honoring the great general, the common soldier, right? So we end up with a lot of memorial culture that is rooted in figuration and very much uh, tied to kind of a Beaux-Arts tradition, looking at naturalism, trying to capture portraiture, the correct uniforms, things of that sort. I think that what we're seeing now is a resistance in, in some ways, not complete, but some resistance to that traditional form of a monument. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of the distance between um, a 19th century monument and what we're seeing um, in Montgomery in the National Memorial to Peace and Justice is kind of a radical break to a certain degree with monument building. Yeah. And what they've done there is, as I'm really intrigued by it, they have decided to um, wholesale 
consider use abstraction to a certain degree to get at embodiment. And so their use of those quartine rectangular boxes that suggest the body, the lynched body, and then to inscribe everyone, every single name that they could recover from the archive onto those is a very different kind of endeavor, right? It is not celebrating a great national story. It is so it is bringing into the public arena the story that is really hard for us to, to reconcile with the United States. And that is, along with democracy, we also have a really long tradition of white supremacy. Yeah. And that lynching is part of that white supremacy, the, the desire to control African-Americans, particularly in the early 20th century. So this memorial is to both honor that memory and to really ask us to think about the connections between lynching and mass incarceration. So it's doing very real political work uh, that is quite different from the political work that's celebrating the nation state that we see in 19th century, let's say, equestrian monuments. One of the things that I thought was, was really interesting um, about, uh, about that monument was the way that I think for, for a long time, um, and maybe still there, there's a view that um, maybe abstraction or, or abstract art or abstract sculpture is somehow less accessible or, or, or less engaging to the public than, than, than figurative art. But it seems like, um, as, you, as you described this connection between abstraction and embodiment, um, and, and, and certainly like you know, other examples, like maybe Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, that, that it, it is actually quite possible for abstract forms to be used in, in a way that really uh, communicates with the public. So if, would, it, would you think that, would that be correct? I think that is, that's a totally correct statement. I think that Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial set a standard for rethinking the monument and the memorial and what it can do. Um, I think her inclusion of names and the process of naming and reclaiming all of the deceased in the Vietnam War was a really important precedent. Yeah. Because then what we see in Montgomery, Alabama is that is in fact, I see that my monument is tied to my lens in, the, in its evocative yeah. use of naming and also abstraction. So yeah. I don't, uh, and in this sense, the public has embraced both of those memorials. It has allowed, it has allowed kind of space for grieving in that abstraction, I would argue. Yeah. And for people to make meaning uh, for themselves in relationship to those two memorials. Yeah. I, I was, I was really struck. I mean, I'd, I'd read about uh, the, uh, the, the monument before, but um, but maybe I missed the part um, that you described where the um, the the going going county by county, there's essentially this challenge or, or invitation to each local county in America to essentially accept to to come to terms and accept their own collective responsibility, and and so any anyone who visits this can see basically which counties in in the country have responded to this or not um i i thought this was um i mean i, I i'm not sure how many you know if, if it's been widely taken up um or not but uh, but i thought it was it was a great a really challenging way of engaging it beyond just this particular location to try and connect with with people in different other locations as well in response to this um this idea that you're talking about both the challenge of the the national memorial for peace and justice is the fact that they made duplicates and that's an astounding effort in itself right when you think about how much monuments cost that they actually created not only do we have the quarantine boxes that are hanging from poles within the main memorial but once you exit the memorial on the grounds laying almost if they're um actual grave uh, markers is that we have each one of those quartine boxes is then a can be taken by the county or the city um, and I know that there are some cities that are are working through this mm -hmm. but I think there are some counties that are never going to claim their quartine boxes and I think that that will say a lot that we will still see that field of boxes there of those memorial markers um, in Cortine as they are transformed over time, right? Through the environment hitting their surfaces, right? That's part of the Cortine, the quality, the materiality of it is that it will transform over time. But I think some, and I would actually argue some Southern states in particular are really wary of bringing these boxes home. It, me it means you have to do a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To reclaim this and to create a monument in your own town or county mm -hmm. or city. That's a lot of both, it's a lot of work for communities to do. 
to yeah. have these conversations. Yeah. There was something um, in, in the article uh, that you wrote about the Crispus Attucks mm -hmm. Memorial in Boston, um, that this, this conceptual um, issue that, that really struck me, the, the, I guess the tension between those who um, wanted to see this memorial as, as a universalizing memorial, as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, a symbol of black resistance and struggle, and that, that that kind of tension, you know, obviously, is not just the case with that memorial, but but can be, I guess, read throughout more recent history as well. And I wondered if you could um, talk about kind of how those how that tension is is navigated and how that kind of works out, whether in that memorial or in other cases. Well, I think it's interesting that you raised this this point with the Crispus Attucks uh, Memorial because it caused an enormous amount of problems, right, in the late 19th century when they were trying to decide, is this a memorial to the overall revolutionary efforts, right, of the American Revolution? Or is it really the fact that he is the first to die in the in the revolutionary, the American Revolutionary yeah. War? Um, I think this idea between the universalizing and trying to recognize African Americans' contribution is one that has been very difficult to actually realize in the United States. Yeah. Um, I think that we tend to want to universalize because it's easier. It's yeah. quite frankly very hard to have the, as I said earlier in relationship to the National Memorial uh, for Peace and Justice, it's very hard for us to have these conversations around race. And, but also, not only about race, but also about history and whose histories get told. Yeah. Um, here we have right now a president who's proposing that we have a patriotic history. Well, what is, what's a patriotic history? What does that look like? Yeah. Who's included? Who's excluded? Mm -hmm. um, and these issues certainly apply to African Americans, but they also apply to women. They apply mm -hmm. to other uh, groups in the United States, the Chinese, the Japanese, Latin Americans, uh, Latinx uh, community. So this is a much broader kind of push-pull that we're seeing, right? So this desire to both, and memorials or monuments in general, in my mind, have are often tied to the state or to the nation. Mm -hmm. And they're delivering, they are delivering patriotic med messages and they mm -hmm. tend to deal with the patriotic message of war, that yeah. we've got the good war. We have a lot of war memorials in Washington, D.C. Um, but when we do get a memorial to an individual, let's say African American, there's always seems to be controversy over this. Right. There is controversy when they put the Denmark Vesey uh, sculpture up. Uh, um, there's controversies around even the Martin Luther King Memorial that is here in Washington. So mm -hmm. it's because we want to read someone, let's say like MLK as a universal figure, but he was really, he was, but he's also pushing for right equal rights for African Americans. It's very explicit. That's what the civil rights movement is about. Um, yeah, it's yeah. for all, but it's also very, how do we get black Americans to be part of this union that we have here in the United States? Yeah. I was, um, I was going to ask you about, you know, whether you might cite examples of uh, maybe more recent monuments that, that in your mind had been uh, particularly successful in in kind of negotiating that. And but when you were um, when you're speaking just now about kind of patriotism and so forth, I was I was thinking also of uh, what you'd written about the um, the Tuskegee, Air, Tuskegee Airmen Memorial and how their their military service. I mean, I, I understand that um, in, in many cases in the civil rights movement, it was uh, it was veterans who who had had served and whose kind of service to the nation gave them a kind of uh, strength and, and authority that mm -hmm. that allowed them to to kind of take a leadership for civil rights. I, I think, mm -hmm. um, and and I wondered whether um, that that Tuskegee uh, Airmen monument might be might be an example of, of a way of acknowledging uh, the 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 experience and the the work and sacrifice of these African American uh, uh, soldiers, while while also speaking to that kind of patriotism or 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 what you would say about that. Yeah, so I think that's both that memorial and a memorial here in D.C. that is about um, the African-American Civil War Memorial. Right. So what those two memorials, I do think, actually exactly what you're saying. They do, first of all, they're showing African-American contribution to military service. This is a long, you know, for almost 100 years, there's been a lot of writing about African-American service, despite the inequities that they've encountered uh, in uh, the United States. 
So that those two monuments, and particularly the Tuskegee Airmen, super interesting because it is a both a what I consider kind of a memorial, but it is also a historic site that you go through and you enter into a airplane hangar and you experience yeah. uh, voices and a very particular kind of site. But what that what they do uh, there uh, in Alabama is to really at Tuskegee is to at the Tuskegee site at the Tuskegee Airmen site is to really raise the important issues of the way in which black servicemen um, were willing to serve the nation despite racism, despite mm -hmm. segregation, despite lack of access to citizenship and the right to vote. They yeah. still put their lives on the line for the union, yeah. for, for, the, for the nation. And so what these two monuments do, although very different times, one, the African-American Civil War, which traces the United States color troops contributions, Mm -hmm. And then the World War II. And it takes up to, to World War II for the army to get integrated. I mean, it's yeah. a very long time where African Americans are serving in US wars. Yeah. They are on the side of American democracy, yeah. um, but they are treated incredibly um, with disregard to a certain extent uh, in these, in the army, in the Navy, et cetera. It's um, uh, the, the uh, experience, I mean, um, I guess just the the kind of well, you you spoke a, a minute ago about the um, in, in the memorial for for peace and justice, the way the way those those names speak, and I, I think there's just um, um, the, the the way like some, something about uh, putting one's as a viewer putting oneself in the place of uh, of of the the Tuskegee Airmen or the or the Civil War veterans who, as you say, were were willing to put their lives on the line for uh, for a country that was at the same time not willing to grant them the fullness of citizenship and and full full rights is mm -hmm. is so um i mean it's it's almost it's almost impossible not to be kind of humbled by by mm -hmm. what they did really um but i guess um i mean we've been speaking about monuments but you'd um you'd also written about how um your uh, your training and, and your background within the academic discipline of art history after doing uh, some significant work in that area led you eventually to decide to move very consciously to a more public facing kind of work um, to the point where your, your primary focus at the present time is, is work that's addressed to the, the public outside the academy. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about kind of how you, uh, how you made that uh, transition. So I think what I decided to do this project, which was a decade ago, which is kind of astounding, yeah. it's and, and working on it dribs and drabs as a full-time faculty member and with lots of service at a public university. Um, I think from the very beginning, I know, from the very beginning, I wanted it to be an open source project, which in many ways is counter to what the Academy, we uh, publish with academic presses, much of what we produce is behind paywalls. I think that's yeah, shifting. Yeah. Um, but I was really interested in how do I kind of work against the paywall? Uh, how do I speak in a voice that's clear to a public so they understand me? Yeah. And so I've been really trying very hard to address most of my work uh, really at a kind of a high school, college level so that yeah. people can engage it and understand it. Um, and so when I first started the project, I immediately thought I need to find platforms that allow it to be open source. Mm -hmm. So I deliver this project on Omeka and on Scalars for now. It may even switch to WordPress. I'm still mm -hmm. working all that out. But part of what I was interested in is how can I shift away from art history, which is a fairly exclusive uh, discipline that yeah. has deep roots in Western tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think after years and years of being an art historian, I felt like, why am I continuing to, I feel like I'm banging on a wall that just is not going to fall down. Yeah. It's not going to change, that is resistant. Um, and I say this in the sense, yeah, there's lots of scholars who are doing interesting works around race and gender, but there is still a profound um, focus on the West and the way that we perceive art history and everything else is non-Western. That's not acceptable anymore. Like we don't get to use that vocabulary. I think also as I was working on this project, I really started to think more and more about the colonial endeavor that's art history in the sense of its alliance with museums and with the marketplace mm -hmm. and with capitalism. And those are in some ways something we can't undo because they're so deeply knitted together, the marketplace 
the kind of gallery museum and then how we do our academic scholarship, I think are very deeply tied together. But it really came from this desire to speak to a broader audience and to move my scholarship out of a certain kinds of engagement with a theoretical framework. It doesn't mean that I don't think about those issues. That has not gone away. But there's a way that we can talk to the public that doesn't have to be uh, so enconced in this language that people don't understand us. Um, yeah, yeah. I've had people say that to me a lot. Like, what exactly? Every time an art historian talks, I don't know what they're talking about. Well, that yeah. actually, we need to be better at that, yeah. uh, right? We want people to understand what we're doing. So. Through the project itself moved me towards this idea of public scholarship. And then I think as I was, I retired from the university in 2017, it was a very deliberate move on my part um, to try to also kind of reinvent myself outside the space of the academy. And is that possible? Like once you spent 20, 25 years doing this work, what would it look to be a public scholar? Uh, would yeah. anybody listen to you? Would anybody come to your project? I mean, these are all concerns I have actually. Yeah. Um, are people reading the work? Are they excited by the work? Do they want to pursue it? Um, and I know that it's it's had some impact because even my neighbors follow me now, follow my site. Uh, oh. They've all the volunteer for the project. They're really, they've come to my lectures at the Smithsonian. So it tells me in that sense, it's really reaching who I want it to reach. Yeah. Um, the project also has uh, one of the bigger things about the, con and, and it's tied to the public scholarship, is I have a fairly, I've mapped all the monuments. So one of the things I've also, it's forced me to think outside the box of a book. Mm -hmm. So to have, you know, the cover, and the end and all that text in between with some images and to really use the digital realm, digital platforms fully, right? So that I can do 3D modeling, I can take multiple photographs, I can do mapping, use mapping apps, I can do textual analysis. I mean, I can do a whole range of activities that are harder to do within yeah. traditional publishing. That, um, you know, that's, that's, so, that's so important, I mean, just to, like the academics are, are kind of conditioned to to get in into these narrow you know behind the paywall as as, as you put it and it's, it's really it's so essential to to get beyond that but I, I wanted to um I, I was curious also I think you mentioned in in one of the one of the articles um uh well basically that that like let's say within within academia or, or even within maybe the more kind of elitist art world uh, you know, there's there's always a sense of like, well, is this artwork? Um, does it does it fit into like the latest kind of critical category, or is it avant garde, or, or or this and that? Whereas whereas if if a work is is trying to actually engage with the the public, you know, it, it, it's it doesn't matter necessarily if it's if it's if the style has been approved by like the elite institutions in New York or or whatever. Um, so I, I was wondering when you're when you're thinking about how how these monuments work. I mean, you you can you can disregard kind of the the art world or academia, but but how do you um, in terms of those kind of theoretical or aesthetic questions? How how do you approach and kind of think about whether whether a piece is good or not, or whether it works or not, and kind of the way that you think about that? Okay, so. This notion of value is, is yeah. kind of at the heart of my project. And I have been told that these are bad artists and I'm like, that, that is unimportant to me. Yeah. Uh, so I do think I work on some very successful monument builders there. And so, so what I can say is I'm intrigued that there is a whole group of men and women who are creating monuments who are not con considered contemporary artists. And I want to ask mm. why not? Yeah. Why is it that we have such a small, narrow group of artists that we study over and over? Yeah. So, and so I still, it's not as if the training that I have, you know, I was an undergraduate major in art history. So 30 yeah. years of art history is pretty much bred into me. Yeah, yeah. So I use all of those tools, let's say, of close visual analysis, of interpretation, right? Yeah. Um, of analysis are really important to the work I do. And I still do it. I still think about theory. I still think about, um, you know, I was thinking the other day, I've been working on a cemetery. I've been thinking about Foucault's notion of heritopias and their relationship to cemeteries. So it's not that I don't think about it. Right, right. Um, it's just that I figure out how do I frame it in a way that the public will understand me? Yeah. Um, and how does it perhaps in a very, in a way that may not be visible to some people, but that scholarship is informing my project. Yeah. I'm just choosing to present it in a plain English format, to be totally honest with you. Yeah. Um, but there, there are value judgments. There are some monuments that I am working on that I think, oh, maybe they shouldn't have received this commission. 
There yeah. are monuments that I'm like, yeah. <laughs> not a great monument. Uh, it's, and it's there and it's in public space and that's what they voted on. Um, there's some of these artists who I think are doing a brilliant job um, with figure figuration. So this becomes a, a, a bigger issue in my project because most of the artists I work on are artists working with the figure. They're working in representation. Yeah. Um, and this is, and communities are picking this. And I would gave a talk um, about a year ago where a pretty well-known contemporary scholar said, well, that's not, they're not really producing cutting edge work. And I'm like, but that's not what this is about. Right. The reality is if we really back up and listen to what communities want, and if we listen to these art processes that work through city governments and percent for art programs, they, people oftentimes want representation. They want something that they can readily understand. And I think that that is not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I do think there are certain artists who might rethink what they're doing, but I also think that there's, I guess what I would like to see is that there is space to kind of open up what art history gets to be. Yeah, yeah. And that this project really gets at that there is a whole range of people producing what we call art who don't fall into the into what our traditional canon. Yeah. yeah. There's so, um, I mean, there, there's the, the, the site, um, the, uh, the, the, the website, the project is, is full. I mean, there's, there's so much on there. And I was wondering if um, uh, just kind of almost, well, if there was, if there was a particular, out of, out of, out of all the different examples that you've, that you've worked on, um, this, if there was a particular monument or, or a particular community that you might cite as, as being especially successful or, or, or where you felt that the, the community or, and the artist really did a good job, like especially so of, of, of kind of succeeding in, in building this kind of public, uh, public monument. Well, this is gonna come as a surprise, but I actually, I believe that the African-American Civil War Monument mm. did a really good job okay. in the sense that it was driven by a city council person yeah. The community knew it was going to be built. They were super excited about it. There's a Girl Scout troops that still take care of it. So it has community engagement today. Yeah. Boat, boat loads of, bus loads, excuse me, bus loads of, of tourists are coming to that site. And what I mean by that is there are very specific kind of tours that they hit with African-Americans who are going to the African-American Civil War Memorial and then to the MLK Memorial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say the MLK Memorial to me is actually successful. I don't actually agree with the social realist form and its gigantic size. Right. However, when you see people moving in that space, and I see I'm around that monument a lot, and it is astounding how people are responding to it. And people are, are going there because they feel as if they can hone in on recognizing the civil rights movement as essentially important to America and to American democracy. And I think that is quite amazing to see. So our critiques of that monument as art historians don't fly with the public. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, it's another thing I was, it occurred to me when you were thinking is that in, um, you're speaking about the uh, kind of addressing the public is that a, a lot of times um, teach in the, in the classroom, like undergraduate, students who haven't been kind of placed into the world of academia for so long um, mm -hmm. are, are often quite open or, or, or less, you know, if we think about art history, it's, it's often kind of the, the more embedded that one is in those institutions, the more narrow-minded one can be in the sense of, of dismissing this or that. But, but, the, but the students who are interested in art history, I would think would be very open to, um, to, to considering works that the more elite institutions might might dismiss. Um, I, but I, I wasn't sure if actually are you um, in the, in this current uh, fellowship or at, at Brown, are you teaching right now at the moment? I am. So yeah. what is, so, and I wanted, so before I answer, I just want to say there's two other memorials that are actually in my area oh, that please, I want to cite as one yeah. memorials that have been really good about engaging. And one of the ones, it took them 20 years, but these, they were very persistent is the uh, memorial at the Contraband and Freedmen Cemetery here in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh -huh. And so they, what I have been impressed, at least in reading the process of this, is how they, at all levels, had community engagement. They got all of the local historical societies 
and community organizations and neighborhood organizations to participate in the conversation. Yeah. Um, they had their, where they put the maquettes into a community center that was in a black neighborhood so that everyone could have the opportunity to come and vote. It feels yeah. as if it was a very engaged process from the beginning. They thought it out well about who was gonna be part of that conversation. So yeah. the city is kind of instigating this and they instigated it because in fact they were wrong and had to actually rectify a problem. But yeah. once the city gets on board, the state is involved, you have these art committees, and they all worked very well together to realize this final monument and memorial in this reclaimed cemetery that had been desecrated. So that's one instance where I've been, it's kind of the model that I keep going back to because it worked. Yeah, yeah. And so oftentimes what I'm noticing in my research is that when communities are not engaged, when they are not talked to, when they do not get to see the maquettes, and the maquette is simply the, the small model of the, of the monument, they become really upset. And you then end up with controversy. Um, and so from the very beginning, we have to be very clear about who the stakeholders are. And the stakeholders are the city governments, but they're also the people who live in those cities and towns and counties yeah. who need to be engaged in that conversation. Um, so I am teaching at Brown. So to get back to your other question, um, I am teaching at Brown uh, this uh, fall and uh, and spring. Um, I'm in DC for the fall term because of COVID. Right. Um, but it is a class um, entitled Monuments, uh, History and Memory. Right. And already I am uh, really pleasantly pleased or surprised at how, just at how engaged these undergraduates are with the issue. Some of them have been protesting, you know, in the streets over the summer. Some of them have uh, worked act actively in their own communities to get monuments removed. Yeah. But in general, for people who have not thought about this, they're really open to, to getting the vocabulary about monuments and to thinking yeah. about like, what are the really tough issues around monuments and how we go about placing them in public space, who gets recognized. So um, I am having, they are open uh, to yeah. looking at all sorts of things, actually. Yeah. Whereas maybe it really is those of us who've been in the academy for a long time who have this kind of top-down approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, that, I also thought, uh, as you were speaking of, um, it, it seemed like uh, what, when you'd written about the Unsung Founders Memorial at the University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. that the, the students were very, that the, the student initiative to, uh, to, to, to do that was for, I mean, the, the sense that, that the, I guess it was, was it the, I don't know if it was the undergraduates specifically who were, who, who felt that they wanted to make a statement on, on their own behalf. Yeah, so to UNC, and of course UNC's had so much controversy with the removal of Silent Sam and the memorial that you're referencing to the unsung um, founders, or unsung, uh, it's really to the bond, what they call the bondsmen, but to really the slave labor that built the university, the enslaved labor yeah. that built the university. Um, that that was a student initiative, and that's intriguing, that they felt like after years of talking about slavery at UNC, controversies around Silent Sam, the Confederate monument on campus, that they as a class felt that they needed to make a direct contribution to the memorial landscape of on campus at UNC. And they chose a contemporary artist who was quite well known for his ideas of dismantling the monument and what it means, kind of inverting the monument. So instead of the pedestal with the lone figure on top, he's put all the people underneath the pedestal holding it up. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of a right symbolic of um, the labor of enslaved uh, men and women at the campus at U University of North Carolina. So that is a really exciting you know, notion that undergraduates are thinking about memorial landscapes. Now, what happened there is that people, I was just thinking about that monument actually yesterday because mm -hmm. I was reflecting on what a brilliant artist Dohosa is, the mm -hmm. Korean uh, artist who created it, and his whole notion of kind of un unseating the, the monument. But it was, even though this was an undergraduate driven monument, it still ran into a lot of controversy because people didn't understand its scale. Yeah. And so that, again, is where I say, well, you need to have more public conversations about what this artist is doing and why the scale is what it is, because that's part of his overall kind of way that he works. But yeah. I think people miss that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, as we know, um, sometimes the monuments are used for things that we can't imagine, like people sitting, changing babies' diapers on that monument because it's a table or eating lunch at the table or doing homework on it. So then does it completely defeat really the memorial aspect of the monument? when it's sitting there being used in odd ways. Yeah. I, um, 
I wanted to, I wanted to ask. Um, I know it's I'm, it's 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 all very much happening in in the present, and it's um, you know things are seemingly happening day by day. But I was I was curious whether um, uh, whether in in the broadest sense, I guess with 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 Black Lives Matter, if if mm -hmm. you are aware of um, are there, are there maybe specific monuments that are being planned or that are going on kind of right now, or if there's any sign that that this particular movement is is going to uh, eventually have have some permanent public monuments created within that kind of overall overall. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think that actually the way we think about monumental landscapes is going to fundamentally change. I don't mm -hmm. think that we can proceed in the same way. Um, I no. point you to Monument Lab, which is a uh, art and history studio in Philadelphia, who are doing tremendous work around rethinking the monument and sponsoring artists, really young, cutting edge artists to rethink what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we can see already what's happening in Richmond with the projections onto um, the Lee uh, monument that already we're starting to see a transition, right? About what these monuments, can, can we interact with the old monument by doing projections, by doing interventions, um, or do we come up with something new? Yeah. Um, and I think we're starting to see that design work, um, particularly through these artists that are supported with Monument Lab. But I think, you know, even someone like, let's say, Lava Thomas out there in uh, California, who had the controversial, I'm not sure why it was controversial, but the Monument to Maya Angelou mm -hmm. is a very different kind of representation. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that was a city official who decided they didn't like it. Well, that's actually the arbitrariness I'm talking about. Right. You can't have one single person say, well, I don't like it, so we're not going to build it. That is not what you agreed to at your Arts Council meeting. Yeah. Um, so I think Lava Thomas is doing fantastic work around rethinking the, um, the monument. So I do think there's artists out there who are working on this and are actively engaged in transforming what we think the memorial la landscape should look like. And that's either through intervention or through complete kind of new ideas of what that memorialist memorial landscape can do yeah I, I was I was just thinking um, there was um, the, the one well an artist who's who's based here um, Jamie Holmes who who arranged for the flyovers with you know, different cities with the planes um, bearing bearing the last words of, of George Floyd and I thought I mean it was it was a, a extremely powerful gesture but then I was also thinking like with so many, I mean, I guess with concept, I mean, this, the whole other issue about kind of um, conceptual art and, and contemporary art, like mm -hmm. obviously it's, it's documented and in a digital age, it, it will live on through its documentation. Um, but but I, it just made me think of how so many contemporary artists use use these kind of forms which are designed to be uh, ephemeral and and it's so it's so different from from a, a, a bronze or marble or courting mm -hmm. kind of kind of thing. So it. It will be interesting to see in another few decades how how that's translated um, into and different. I think, think that the ephemeral monument is okay. I think yeah. we're tied to the notion that we have to have a bronze statue put in place. Right. Right. And I think the ephemeral mo monument actually uh, makes us work harder. We certainly see that in relationship to the Holocaust that we've have ephemeral m monuments that were put right. up, you know, in Germany that literally are meant to, you interacted and they're meant to be contained within your own memory once it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a fascinating way to think about this, that these, or I'm noticing um, that there's some, a group called the Smith Group that created something called Society's Cage and it was up on the mall for just two days. Yeah. And their whole idea is that they wanna travel it. So that's also fascinating to me that we, are we gonna have these kind of traveling temporary monuments that show up in different cities across the United States? Um, and that's a very high level, like the way they thought that monument is very high level and very conceptual. It should yeah. be intriguing to see how it plays out in each city in the United States as it travels around. Yeah. Um, and what that would uh, look like. But, you know, someone pointed out, but, you know, I run actually, I started a digital memorial after George Floyd's death that is on mm -hmm. Instagram. And someone said, well, you're created an ephemeral, but of course it lasts forever because it's somewhere right. there. Somewhere. on the internet um <laughs> so i am i'm also interested that we could use things like the digital realm really instagram facebook um yeah. youtube video snapchat even tiktok if we were allowed to use it to create memorial spaces yeah 
because I think what I'm noticing in these spaces is that we have don't have a way to collectively grieve over this. We don't have a good way to individually grieve right. over uh, what we're witnessing with the violence against African uh, against blacks and uh, brown people, but we also don't have a way, quite frankly, to grieve around COVID. That we have 200,000 plus people who died in the United States. What does it look to remember them? What does it look to grieve? And I think that these digital memorials are helping people in that way to grieve yeah. and to kind of figure out a plan uh, to yeah. move forward. It, it, I mean, people really need some some sort of ritual or, or action to participate in something. We really do, and particularly uh, as we know that Funeral services have been hard to ha happen. Um, people are not, you know, having those practices that were the mortuary practices, even though our funerary practices that we're used to, have yeah. been really restricted because of COVID nineteen. So, if we are and grieving over Zoom is not the same. It's not the same as going to a wake or going to a gravesite or being with your family members during an intense time of loss. And so it should be interesting to see in the next 20 years, like what exactly, how, how are we going to remember this moment that we're in? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a really, um, I, I, can, I can only imagine, I can only imagine what it's gonna be like. We, the, actually the, the founding director of this uh, institute uh, just passed away a month or two ago and there was a, a truly wonderful uh, Zoom mm -hmm. memorial, but, but it, it's not, you know, it's not the same. Um, not quite but, the same, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the series, Falling and Rising, Public Monuments and Cultural Heritage in a Time of Protest, from the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History at UT Dallas. And our guest today has been Dr. Renee Ater, who's the founder and current director of the project Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my project and about monuments. <laughs>